In this video I struggle with a mini cassette, play the slowest game ever and fix a 42 year old docking station. Music. Welcome to the second episode of Adventures in Archiving. It's a mix of words I know you might find unexpected. This time we will be focusing what I'm unboxing here, the Sharp PC-1251, incorporated into the Sharp CE-125, an unexpected purchase. You probably understand that in the world of collecting old computers, most purchases are unexpected. In this adventure we'll be focusing on this little tape that came included, and I struggle to put back in the player. The Sharp PC-1251, unlike its name, is of course not a PC. Well, not if you see the abbreviation PC as implying personal computer. No, in this case PC stands for Pocket Computer, a mainly calculator sized type of computer that could perform calculations and run simple basic programs and could be stored in your pocket. That is where the name Pocket Computer comes from. Examples of Pocket Computers are the Casio FX880P, the PB100, also produced by Casio, and my personal favorite, the TRS-80 PC2. I like this one because it's so bulky. I guess my special effects don't meet IMAX quality yet. So I got this little nifty device from the Dutch version of eBay, and it has an external audio in, a cassette drive, and a built-in printer. I paid 25 bucks for this, and before we move on, I wanted to share a little theory I have. A theory that relates to bidding 25 euros on the Dutch version of eBay. I found that 25 euros is an amount that a certain type of seller is quite prone to accept. For instance, I also got this Tandy 200 for the same amount. I like to separate sellers into two categories, one being fellow collectors and the other being I found this in the insert location like an attic, shed, trash, etc. This category also separates into two, one seeing gold, the other seeing a nice sort of recycling opportunity. Recycling in the sense of it going to someone who will enjoy it. These are most of the time also folks that are not familiar with the competitive world of collecting. And that is the category of seller I'm mainly after. Tap into their mindset and I think that when you offer 20 euros, they'll think that's too little and wait for a higher bid, leaving the opportunity for other collectors to offer a lot more money for a certain item. While 25 euros is just an amount that they are more likely to accept. I think mainly because it's just over that threshold of not coming across as lowballing. And why not 30? Well, because 30 could risk turning the I found this in the you name it looking for a nice new home into the I found this in the you name it and seeing the potential for gold. But that's a slightly over exaggerated side tangent I was thinking of. Interested in more, you can buy my very cheap $200 course on how to get rich of the Dutch version of eBay in an hour. Back to the archiving we are here for. Coincidentally, I already own a Tandy TRS-80 PC3. This, in essence, is a 1251, just with the Radio Shack branding on it. Correct me if I'm wrong, this one still works. I fear that the 1251 might not, especially when I look at the LCD screen. It appears to have degraded over time. I know there are replacements, but they are a bit expensive at the moment, so I'm going to wait a bit before I get those, fearing I might regret this because they can potentially be sold out when the moment comes I want them. Even though I doubt that it will work, I still wanted to change out the batteries. This also offers the opportunity for a quick look inside. I unscrewed this daughter board and that appeared to have, based on a quick Google search, some CMOS RAM on it. 16K per chip, I think. The computer runs on two 2032 coin cell batteries, which are still very common. Screwing back the backplate and trying the computer, which as expected did not display anything. I used the flashlight to see if maybe that would tell me if it showed anything. So that means that in this video I'm going to use my PC3. I wondered if there was any price difference back in the day. Would getting a Tandy or a Sharp be cheaper? So I spent a couple of minutes looking around the internet to find the original prices of these units, which was quite a challenge. So what I'm going to tell now is pure speculation. The PC-1251, based on what I can find, cost 29,800 yen when it was released in 1982. Correct that for inflation to 2024, that would be around 62,200 yen. 
The PC3 was sold by Radio Shack for $99.95 in 1982, which today would be around $329. Using AI, I calculated the exchange rate both ways, which if I'm correct, and I have a lot of reasons to believe I'm not, that the Sharp would be the less affordable choice. Also, taking into account that you would have to fly from the US to Japan to buy it for that price. Wouldn't surprise me if Sharp made the US price more closely match the PC3 price. One thing that bothered me about the docking station was that there appeared to be leftover gunk of a removed sticker. I wanted to clean that away, but feared that doing that would damage the finish on the docking station, a fear based on cleaning this type of plastic in the past. So reluctantly I went ahead and tried to clean it off, making sure I only used warm water. No chemicals like alcohol for this cleaning job. I used paper towels to dry away the water. To my surprise, what appeared to be stubborn sticker residue cleaned away nicely, leaving behind some stains, but those are in the plastic, I think, as the surface feels smooth. So now it is time to open the case. I'm quite sure we are going to encounter some battery asset in this process. As every pocket computer docking station I have opened over the years, and believe me when I say it has been a bunch now, has had leaking batteries. The case was pretty straightforward to open. And as promised, I could see some battery spillage already. I decided to just cut the battery away, I have no intention to replace it at this moment. Most of my docking stations I just power using the power connector. I bent back the metal tabs that held it in and removed the battery. Of course trying not to touch the acid. I should have worn gloves probably. This part of the PCB seemed to be quite corroded by the acid. A first use case for the very long cotton swaps I bought, mainly for cleaning tape heads, I guess. I'm going to need a stronger brush to make this clean. I tested the traces with my multimeter and they appear to not have broken yet. Time to reassemble the case. I cut away some of the paper to make that a little bit easier. Now I want to test the functionality of the docking station, starting with a printer, I guess. I connected the power supply to it. Someone helpfully drew the polarity on the case, this being center negative. I started typing a command to see what would happen, but it gave back an error. I pressed the paper feed button to see if that would move the printer, but immediately regretted that decision as the paper got stuck. First I tried to pull it with the case still closed, but that didn't work. So I had to open the case again and fiddle to get the paper out, fearing I would break this fragile printer. Plugging the power back in. Now the paper feed button works, still not printing. I wanted to move my attention from the printer to the cassette deck for a moment. I unscrewed it from the case. The first belts I saw appeared to be in good condition, but taking away this wheel showed that one of the belts had sadly seized up. I really don't like cleaning up rubber, but this appeared to be not too much. Then I spent a couple minutes fiddling to get a replacement belt in place. I forgot some gunk here, so I cleaned that up. It appears to do the trick again, so let's screw it back in. Testing the drive without a tape, it appears to function correctly. Although I would say it travels a bit faster than I expected. Of course this drive is never going to function like a standard compact cassette one. Though I have to say it's a nice little cassette drive. I spent some time reading through a manual I found online. And think I now know how to get the printer, assuming that it works, to print. You should press shift enter to put it in printing mode, which shows a P on the screen. And as I hoped, the printer printed the thing I typed in, although it did not yet print the results of the calculation. I tried the print command again, but got an error, then realizing it probably wants a line number. So I added one of those, and that also resulted in it printing. Great, printers related to Radio Shack get way too much airtime on this channel. I apologize. 
So now it's time to move on to the cassette tape. It has a very little label on it saying PROG, which is good because I hope that means it has programs on it. And I have an idea on how to digitize this. Yes, I want to use this Sony Micro Cassette Quarter M455 that I bought for I think a euro at the thrift store. So the tape appears to fit and the quarter can play it. The rewind was a bit too weak to rewind the tape to the end, so I used a pencil to rewind the little tape. I'm going to connect it to my Mac using this cable. So I press record and play on the quarter. Let's see what happens. Ah, a lovely sight to behold. Computer audio. Look, already five programs recorded. After 30 minutes, the tape finished. Appears to have eight programs on side two. Now let's try side one. Fast forward another 30 minutes and that side has five programs on it. I connected the output of my Mac to the input of the docking station and tried loading a program, but that didn't quite work as I hoped it would, as the computer started to produce a weird sound. I believe that is computer audio we are hearing come from the PC3. I already suspected that the computer required mono audio but wasn't sure, so I downloaded a program of the internet to see, and when I opened the WAV file with Audacity I could see it was mono. In addition to that I also read through the manuals to see how loading works with this docking station. I split the tape to mono and tried again, which did not work. I think it is time to try a different way of backing up this tape. Since I had a first version digitized, I felt a bit more safe putting the cassette in the drive. I don't have an empty spare tape on hand to try, which of course would have been a bit more safe. And as is visible, it appears to be functioning as it should. I did not expect that, as recently I have had a lot of trouble trying to fix another Sharp cassette deck. I found an excellent blog post on the Sharp CE125 on this website by the retro engineer, clear pictures and a straightforward story. He wrote that it is possible to record audio of the internal deck with the wire soldered to a certain chip. So let's see if we can replicate that with my unit. Here is where the video is going to be out of focus and a fair warning to all soldering purists. I'm an amateur who can barely hold the iron straight, so I'm warning you if you don't like that stuff. I pre-tinned some wire, connected it, making sure not to connect it to anything else, and connected it to a simple 3.5mm audio jack. Like a real professional, I used heat shrink, but the wrong size. I connected the ground wire to this screw, which appeared to go to ground. Turned it on and as nothing popped, hoped it was a successful mod. Of course a mod of temporary nature, I don't like wires coming out of this. I typed the loading command and then pressed play and then realized that the audio was also appearing on my computer. Although on a first glance it did not look too great, a bit loud. I think something went wrong as the later audio looked very weird. I thought this would be a good moment to see if the docking station actually would load a known working program. Maybe a trace is corroded or something else is rendering this thing not working. So I connected the audio jack again and played the file of my computer that I found online. I believe a sort of typing game. It loaded fine. Not the most exciting game I've played, but still neat it is on a computer of this form factor. It displays letters which you type followed by more letters. I wanted to see if I could use this program called Pocket Tools to test my WAV files, so I downloaded it to my Windows PC. I have to say that this is a program that is well above my pay grade, although even an amateur like me can see that it is quite an impressive piece of coding. I used a program called wave to bass to see if I could convert one of my WAV files recorded with the quarter to a bass file. A bass file can be opened using a simple text editor to display the basic code. Then I spent some time reading the manual multiple times as most things I tried didn't work or gave an error. 
but putting the WAV files in the same folder as the programs seemed to help the program attempting to convert it to a BAS file, as by doing that, all of a sudden, the BAS file started to appear in the folder. Most of them being empty, or better said, not working. But then, to my surprise, when opening a BAS file that I noticed appeared to be a bigger file size than the empty ones, I saw basic code. And after spending two days with this little computer, you can imagine that I was quite happy. Sadly though, it only worked one more time. Comparing the two, I could see that they are both different. I'm not good with basic code, as when I was born it was already long obsolete. So I asked a good digital friend to explain to me what this code could be used for. And it was speculated that this code could be used for calculating the tide's height and printing the results. The script has crossed the 2500 worth mark, so I think it's now time to start wrapping up this adventure in archiving a small tape. I'm now going to summarize all the things that I forgot because the script has reached 2500 words, but the most important thing I realized while editing this is that one of the things that I also have to try is to see if this tape will actually just load using the cassette drive, not only uh, digitize it to my computer, but also just use the tape, put it in, press play, type C load, and see if it actually loads just from tape. So that is something that also will happen in a future video. Uh, promises I make like this uh, normally take about two years to fulfill. Keep that in mind, but I promise you now that we're, I'll also try to see if I can load this lovely little tape just using the cassette, uh, the cassette drive. Back to the descriptive uh, video. I hope that this will be seen by some people who are more experienced in the field of backing up this type of computer programs. I've opened a page on my archive for this tape where you can find the WAV files for your own tinkering and the two BAS files I made. Maybe someone can recover more from this than I did. I know that I left some loose ends when it comes to the audio that I recorded directly from the docking station, but those WAV files are for a different video, as I hope to return to this topic. Also, I looked into finding an emulator that I could try these files with, but sadly, the only one I could find was one that didn't support using tapes and wasn't free. Which isn't any sort of complaint, as I can imagine it's a timely and expensive endeavor building one of these emulators. So what I'm trying to say, more to come on this PC3 1251CE125. A lot of numbers and letters, I know, exciting. If you are, and I bet it won't be many among those who made it all the way here, I want to especially thank you for watching. Bye.